Hi, my name is Tamika Brooks. I'm an administrator here at Cathedral of Praise. We just want to say thank you for tuning in from wherever you're viewing us from. If you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. So let's jump into this amazing message. First Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to start at verse 1, read through 13, read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. Verse 3, therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Read. Verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Read. 5, and there are varieties of ministries in the same Lord. Read. 6, there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. Read. 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Read. 8, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Read. 9, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit. Read. 10, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. Read. 11, but one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. 12, for just as the body is one and yet has many parts, and yes. all the parts of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. Read. 13, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Look at your neighbor really quickly and tell him, I matter, and so do you. Come on, tell him, I matter, and so do you. Tell him, it's a healthy church. Now clap your hands and bless God for the reading of his word. Listen to me real quickly. We're not going to be <laughs> two days, uh, but we'll be here for, let me get this word out to you quickly. Um, um, we're still in our series All In, um, but today I want to talk about the dynamics of a healthy church. Um, healthy church is not, uh, by some it is categorized by how many people would show up in a building. So for some, they would come in, they would see all of you assembled here and say, wow, this is a healthy church. Uh, they, they're doing good. But a healthy church spiritually is not determined by how many people are in a seat. It is determined by how much love is in the seats one for another. Okay, I'm going to come for you again and hit you in your head. A healthy church in the spirit is not determined by how many people can assemble in a building. It's determined by the people who are assembled and how much love they have one for another. You can have a ministry with 5,000 people showing up every week, but if 4,500 of those 5,000 hate each other, that's not a healthy church. You can have another church that has only 50 people, but they act like a family. They're there for each other. They pray for each other. They intercede for each other. That means they are a healthy church. Now, we have the ability, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, to be both healthy and well. So I don't just want us to have a building full of people, but I want the, the, the row or the seats to be filled with love while the people are filled in the building. We can't just be another place where people just come do church, but have church, but ain't got the church in them, don't got God in them, come in to have a good time, hear some good music, hear a good preacher, and then go on about their business and not care about nobody else and their family and their whereabouts and all that. The devil is a lot. That happens at the other, your cousin them church, which is why you need to tell your cousin them to come over here. We will have a church that when you come in and sit on my row, if I pick up in my spirit, something is wrong with me. I don't have to get in your business and know everything, but I'll reach my hand over and touch your shoulder and say, my brother, you can make it through this and I'm praying for you. I'll reach my arm over to my sister and say, sister, I love you to life and there's nothing you can do about it because sometimes when somebody comes in and they sit on that row they thought that was going to be their last Sunday they thought that was going to be their last moment and sometimes all somebody needs to know is that somebody else cares that somebody else sees me that somebody else knows me and we're going to be somebody say the healthy church 
in the text, Paul is dealing with the church at Corinth. Let me cut through the field and get you where you need to be. Uh, Paul is dealing with the church at Corinth. They are in a mess. They have gone through some stuff. They have been turned over to their ideas. They've been turned over to what they think they should do instead of what God has determined for them to do. Their leaders have got off focus and their leaders have become self-centered. Their leaders have become self-centered and they've become very prideful. Let me tell you something. The sign of a good pastor is not how good we preach. It's how great we can love. I lost y'all. I can operate in the assignment and the gift of an evangelist. But my ultimate gift and calling is that one of an apostolic leader, which is a shepherd or a poleman. My job is to make sure you're good. I lost y'all here. My job is to make sure that I can't live it for you, but I can give it to you the best way I can, but I can't be your God. Let me share something with you. Don't ever put me in a place that God should be. Don't ever let, no, no, no. Let me, because I will let you down. I'm telling you up front. You want to be let down, try to make me your God. I don't want to be your hero. I don't want to be Superman. I don't want to be Batman. I don't want to, I just want to be the preacher. I want to be the pastor. I want to be myself, and I want you to depend on God to be your source. Never make a man or a woman just because they got a mic in their hand or a because they got a mic in their hand, your God. I am not your God and nobody else is but the one who sits on the throne up high. He's the only one that can manifest in your life. I can pray for you. I can give you a couple of dollars in your life. I can do all of that. But when it comes down to the well-being of your, your care, the well-being of your life, God is the only one that can be called Jehovah Jireh. He's the only one that can be called Jehovah Rapha. He's the only one that can be your healer, your, your deliverer and your salvation he is the only somebody say he's the only one so no matter how much you love me don't give me no glory no matter how much you I don't mind the appreciation and I appreciate you appreciating me but I am not your God and I don't want to be I don't want that kind of pressure I don't want it I don't want it I don't want it I want to give the pressure where the pressure is due and that pressure belongs to God because he's the only one that can supply all of our needs Corinthians at a a place the church in Corinth the Corinthians are at a place where they're in a destruction mode destruction now the Lord is trying to tell them through Paul if y'all keep on with this way y'all gonna be jacked up from the flow up now these are people watch this ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters who are supposed to know God but yet they're bickering between themselves they're supposed to be grown but they acted immature they're supposed to be grown, but they're acting like babies. The worst thing in the world is to have a grown person still acting like a baby. Hey, oh, some of you don't want, okay, they sitting next to you. Never mind, don't clap, don't clap. And, and what happened in the, in, with the Church of Corinth, trying to cut through the field quickly, what happened was they begin to bicker amongst themselves because they begin to have issues with one another because they begin to get jealous of each other's abilities and skill sets. The worst thing you can do in the church is get jealous of somebody who's doing something and you know you really can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's a bad day when you get frustrated and want to take over something that you know you're not qualified to do only because you don't want somebody else doing it. It's time out for that. And what I want you to know is in order for us to be a healthy church, you're going to have to operate in the area God has anointed you, gifted you, and promised you, and it's going to all have to come together. Can I say this to you? All of us don't have the same gift and the same talents. We all got something different that we're able to do. I may be able to sing, they can sing, but we all sing in a different way. I can play, they can play, but we all play in a different way. I can walk, you can walk, but we all walk in a different way. But what God is saying is there's a need for your walk. There's a need for your gift. There's a need for your talent. The church at Corinth had got in a place where they were bickering because they started to hate on each other. Now, I know for a fact, I know we don't have no haters in here. But your cousin's church got haters. 
So I'm giving you some information to give to your cousin so they can talk to their people at their church so they can tell them to stop hating on each other. You don't have to be jealous because God is using somebody in a particular season. The old church would tell us if you just hold on, there's a day coming for you that God will anoint you, God will prepare you, and God will get you. Sometimes God is using someone else because he's preparing you for a moment that when he does set you up where he's going to set you up, you ain't got to worry about falling down. For some of us, God is just waiting on us to position ourselves so he can use us in a mighty way. Can I share something with about 100 people? There is a world that needs everything God has placed on the inside of you. Now that's for the person who's asking, well, what is my gift? What is my talent? What am I supposed to do? And my prayer, and I prophesy over your life that God is about to reveal to you what your gift, your talent, and your anointing is. Now there's another group of y'all that's selfish, you stingy, and you've been sitting on it. You know what it is. He showed you a long time ago, but because you're lazy, and you don't want to do nothing, you sit on your blessed assurance and say, nah, I just don't feel like it. You better get somebody else. 2025, this is September. We're in a spiritual new year already. This is not the year for you to sit down on your gift. It's not the year for you to sit down on your talent. It's not the year for you to sit down on your anointing. God is saying, I want to use every bit of you because there's a world that needs what I place on the inside of you. That's why, thank you, Holy Spirit. That's why the enemy has tried to fight some of y'all like he is because he's trying to make you give up on your call give up on your gift give up on your talent but the devil is a liar and his mother-in-law is too I refuse to have you gifted and not doing nothing I refuse to have you talented and not doing nothing there's work to be done there's a generation that needs your gift. There's young people that need your wisdom. There's children that need your history and your story. There's somebody that needs to grow from what God has allowed you to accomplish. Tell your neighbor, don't be selfish. There's a generation, hear me, that needs to share the opportunities God has given you. Same way I stood here with my son today. Don't take nothing away from me. The better he do, the better I look. And I look good. I was watching him run up and down the court this weekend. I'm looking, me and Jerry was watching. I'm, I'm, me and Jerry having a whole conversation on the sideline about everything they doing wrong. But we're sitting there talking. Sorry, players at Mount Sac. We was talking about y'all bad. But, uh, uh. He's run up and down the court, and, and, and Jerry and I are talking about the days, back in the day, how we, we were trained, and he's, he's, he, he thought he was a little better than me until I shared him my story, and he was like, oh, you're the GOAT. I said, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, okay, no, he didn't. Stop lying. Okay, so, so, but it was in his spirit. He just didn't say it out loud. Uh, uh, but, but we got to talking about the old days and how we trained and how coaches dealt with us and all that kind of stuff. And it's that level that then I began after our conversation, I had a conversation with my son. Then the next day he kind of self-corrected. And when he got in, he did kind of everything that he was supposed to do that we had talked about in the previous day before or the previous moments before the game. And what happened was we were able to share our life experience with each other. I was able to take part of his experience, mix it with mine and share it with my son, which made him a better athlete when he hit the floor. At at the end of the day, if we don't start sharing our stories and we don't start sharing our experiences, we won't know. And I'm going to tell you young folk in the building, y'all need to start listening. Y'all need to shut up sometime and just listen. You don't know. You don't know. You don't. You ain't been here before. You don't know. You got parents who have been there. You got grandparents who have been there. Take a moment sometime and just be quiet and just listen. You think you know what's best for yourself. You think you know, and this ain't just a teenager. It's some of y'all young adults. You think you know what's best for yourself. You think you got it figured out. But if you still living with your parents and you still borrowing money, you ain't figured it out yet. You may need to listen until you can get it together to be where you need to be. I know ain't nobody going to say amen, but I, amen. But we have a generation that doesn't want to listen. We have a generation that does not want to take heed to advice. And what Paul is telling the church at Corinth is y'all need to listen. You're allowing your discord and your distractions to become your, 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 your fault. You're allowing your, or your place of, of demise. You're allowing the, your inability to take instruction to destroy you. It ain't just for the teenagers. 
It ain't just for the young adults. Some of us older folk are worse than these teenagers. Okay. Be quiet. Why I get in trouble? You, you, you old and petty. It's too, never mind. But here it is. You too old to be that petty. You're just too old. You too old. You too old. Because this is what I know. This is what I know. And y'all, for the older church, y'all correct me if I'm wrong. The same Holy Ghost that make you speak in tongues will tell you that's enough. So I'm scared of the person who, but you don't never know when enough is enough. Because the same Holy Ghost that make you quicken, the same Holy Ghost that make you run in church, the same Holy Ghost that make you have a fit in church is the same Holy Ghost that will tell you, no, you're going too far. Be quiet. Y'all didn't have that Holy Ghost? Oh, y'all got the Walmart one. It's a little different. The real spirit of God governs your life. The Spirit of God will tell you when to stop telling people off. The Spirit of God will tell you when to shut down and pray. The Spirit of God. And what Paul is trying to tell the church at Corinth is you all have yielded to your own understanding. You started to do ministry your way and not the way God designed it to be. Which is why you're distracted. God help me. Which is why you're caught up in pride. Which is why you can't, you can't even get along with each other. Which is why you're bickering. And Paul says this should not be named among us. So this is it. When you understand, somebody say, I'm important. I'm important. And look at somebody and say, and so are you. When you understand that you have a gift and you have a call. Now watch this. For some, you're just coming in the thing, right? You're just getting here. You, you is, uh, some of y'all in the building, you James Cleveland say. You Andre Crouch saved. Oh, happy day. You was got saved when that came out. Some of y'all John P. Key saved. Some of y'all stomp Kirk Franklin saved. That was your era. <laughs> Some of y'all Todd Tribbett saved. Some of y'all, Jonathan McReynolds say. Who, I don't even know who else is out there. Uh, ooh, that, you, y'all went back. I mean. Some of y'all, Kendrick Lamar on your way to being saved. Whatever the case may be. <laughs> hey, hallelujah. Some of y'all Drake and Hyde and saved on your way. I don't know. But, but, but at the end of the day, it was a jab. I know. It was a hard one too. Um, whatever level you are, if you're coming into the faith, watch this. This is the reason I brought that up. Because you may say, I don't know enough to know what I'm gifted at. Right? I don't know enough to know what my talent is. Let me share this with you for the, for the person who's kind of coming into it. What was your passion before? Analyze what your passion was. What did you love to do? If, just for instance, you could persuade people to do whatever you wanted them to do in your previous life, then you may have a gift of gab and persuasion. Hear me. If you could get out on the block, Spin a couple of corners. It, it's a true. And you can do all that math in your head without writing nothing down. Then that means you may have a marketing thing on you you didn't even know you had. Because you don't do them kind of numbers without having to figure out how to talk people into working for you. So you have the gift of persuasion. So one of your giftings could be, instead of me spinning the block, instead of me dicing this out, instead of me making this happen on this end, I'm going to turn around and for the kingdom of God, instead of selling that, I'm going to sell the hope of Jesus Christ. 
I know how to bargain with people. I know how to negotiate with people. I know how to go to where I came from because I understand the language and I understand the lingo. So it could be that the only reason you traveled that way is so God could pull you out, clean you up, so he could send you back in to pull somebody else out so he could clean them up so y'all would go back in to pull somebody else out. If you don't look at it that way, then you look at your story as a waste of life. And I don't care what, what way your life went, it was not a waste. I'm going to say it again. I don't care what kind of mistakes you made. I don't care how many times you jacked up. I don't care how many whatevers you did. You are not a mistake and your life is not a mistake. Romans 8 and 28 says, and for we know that all things work together. God is the only, God help me. People will take your story, turn it around and weaponize it. God will take your story, turn around, heal you, deliver you, and then use it as a weapon against the enemy. God said, I'll take your mess and make it a message. I got to move. So whatever your gifting is, I got to get to these points so I can't break down. Maybe that's another teacher we're doing, gifting. Whatever your gift is, this is the point. You have to use it properly. And when a healthy church uses their gifting, they don't use it for their benefit. They use it for the kingdom of God. Verse 1 and 3, let's get to the text so I can move. I don't have a lot of animologies today, but I will... Uh, give you the thought process in which we do have uh, uh, in verse 1 and 3 because i got to get through this real quick. The only way to be a healthy church using your gift properly is you got to learn and you got to be in a place where you're always lifting Jesus up. you got to make sure Jesus, somebody say he's lifted. The book of 1 Corinthians was written as a response to a letter that the Corinthian Christians had sent to Paul, in that letter they had asked him all kinds of questions about daily living and church life. So when you see in 7 and 1, even in that case, now the matters, uh, 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 the matters they wrote about, if you will, let's cut to the field, Paul begins to address those questions, beginning with the subject of even marriage and divorce. Then in 8 and 1, now about food sacrifices to idols. And then 16 and 1, now about the collection of God's people. And here in 11 and 1, now concerning spiritual gifts. He addresses a lot, but in our text today, he's talking about your spiritual gifts. They had a lot of questions about spiritual gifts and what they were supposed to accomplish in the church. And today, some of you probably got a lot of questions. Like, and, and I know, that, that, and for this, I'm talking to the person now that, that sits and you say, well, I'm, 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 I want to I do something. I'm ready to do something. Can I tell y'all that this coming year, it's going to be enough for everybody to do. Because my, my plan, if the Lord be my keeper and my, my helper, my plan is I don't want nobody sitting idle. And anybody that want to work, I want to find a place for them to work and find a place for them to be active in ministry. Because sometimes, y'all hear me, my, and I know this may sound funny, but sometimes people's connectivity to ministry is really what keeps them going. Their ability to operate is what keeps their lifeline alive. The question, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 they had questions, the first of, of them being, what is a spiritual gift? A spiritual gift is a tool given, watch this, to you by God that equips you to serve a specific ministry even in the church. The Corinthians question went further than, uh, than wanting, to, they wanted to know what a spiritual gift was. For those of you asking that question, I'm going to try to give you a little bit and we'll talk about it later. They wanted to know how to use it properly and further, they wanted to know what would it be, what would be the evidence that they could look for that would let them know it had been used properly. There were many at the church at Corinth who were attempting, watch this, to exercise their spiritual gifts and their tools, but the wrong result was happening because they were using them improperly. That, that some of you have the gift and the tool of influence. Are you using your influence? Watch this. When you have the gift of influence, if you are not pointing people to God, you are improperly using your influence. And everybody's an influencer nowadays. 
you got three followers and a cat, you are an influencer. Somebody one time was like, they put, I'm an influencer. All you do is repost everybody else's stuff. That's not an inf you're not influencing nothing. You're a marketing thing for free for somebody else. Like any other tool, when used in a way that is de the designer never intended, they can create great suffering. God, your tool or your tool guy. Uh, 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 I, I'm you. If he don't mind, I hope he don't get mad. I'm gonna use John, the other John, the John Hardy John. We got a lot of Johns, a lot of Chris's, a lot of it's a whole lot of y'all. Everything, big this one, small this one, light skin this one, dark skin this one. It's hard to keep up with everybody. But when I need to do something, I go to Hardy and I'll say, John. He like, what's up? I was like, uh, I need this tool. And one one thing, John, and it kind of it was ag aggravating at first because he act like I don't never know what I'm doing, but I know a little something. But I was like, I need this tool. He be like. For what? <laughs> like, John, just let me use it. And then, then John would do this, I'll go with you. I said, I want to go. I want y'all to bother. But the thing is, because he's a craftsman, God help me. His thing is, I know what the tool is used for may be better than you. And before I send you with the tool with no instructions, let me accompany you while you go use or show me what you want to do. And God is saying, instead of trying to use tools, at least talk to the tool maker about the way he wants you to use the tool that he gave you. So that's what they're doing. They're trying to get instructions. I'm gifted. I don't know what to do with it. Got to use the tools right because if you don't, you will damage somebody. You remember when you tried to fix something at home and you grabbed that hammer and you grabbed that nail and your thumb told you don't ever do that again. You remember trying to do things and fix things and some of y'all, the men in your life, you just want to tell them don't ever fix nothing again. Because they go, you didn't, you didn't try to fix the elect electrical thing because all it was working, it was just a little short in the socket. You said, I got it, I can change the light. You change the light now when you turn on the dishwasher, come on. And now the other, the other room going off because you're not an expert at it. But at, if you would just have sought an expert at doing it, maybe it would, because when you don't do it right, you always got to go back and do it again. Now, I know this ain't the church that y'all grew up on, but back in the day when I was coming up, it's like washing dishes. If you didn't do them right, all of them coming back out the cabinet, going back in the sink, and you're going to do it all over again. Dishes, washing. See, these kids like, well, you didn't have a dishwasher? Yes. And my mama said, why would I use a dishwasher when I got you? I got a dish. He'll tell you, I got a dishwasher at my house right now. Will hardly ever use it. Because I'm so used to washing dishes. I think by the time I load it up, turn it on, I could have got everything washed and dried and put it up by then. Then if I put them in there, I got to walk away, wait for it to get done, come back, and then put all the stuff. Then you got to wipe it down again to get all the spots off of it because the house I grew up, you didn't put nothing in no cabinet with no spots on it. You do oh, no, 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 no. You didn't do that. So you might as well go on and wash it. But the way I was taught and the tools I was given allowed me to be successful in my life. And what God is saying to the church is allow me to give you the directions on how to use the tools I've given you but the thing about God is when he gives you direction the tools are not used so you can be manipulative the tools are not used so you can do what you want to do the tools are not used so you can get the advantage over someone else it's used for the kingdom of God uh, um, even false religion have become an issue because they have begun to practice false religion before coming to Christ and have been all about meeting their own personal needs and fulfilling their own desires. Self-fulfillment is a slow killer. Self-pity is a slow killer. But the greatest one of them all is the spirit of pride. Pride will keep you from getting things right 
pride will keep and y'all say, why are we talking about pride? Because a lot of us, if we're not careful, will operate in pride and don't even know it. And now the culture has given us language that allows us to camouflage. I'm just keeping it real. No, you're prideful. That's just the way I am. No, you're prideful. They're going to have to accept me the way I am. No, you're prideful. Because at the end of the day, it ain't even about you changing for them. It's about the change that God is wanting to make in your life. And we so stuck on not changing for people, we won't even change in the way God is asking us to change. And then we treat God like a bad relationship. You're going to just take what you get from me. And God said, I'm not in a place to take what you're going to give me no more. I'm going to put you on your back if I got to to get out of you what I put in you. I'm sorry. God never told the believer to focus on yourself. Scripture we read in, in, in Matthew the other week said, if you are trying to save your life, he said, those of you, you're going to come after me, lay down your life. You're trying to save it, you lost it. But if you give it up, you gained it. When was the last time, watch this, you did something for somebody else and didn't want nothing in return? When was the last time you extended help to somebody else and didn't want nothing in, in return? Or does everything you do come with a tag? Do, do, have y'all ever met somebody that really always puts themselves in position because they feel better when they can bail people out and hold it over their head? Never mind. I'm sorry. That is not your husband or wife. It is not. I'm talking about it's not your cousin. No, it's not. That is not your mom and daddy. No, it's not. <laughs> Self-fulfillment and focusing on self was the exact, exact opposite of what God called them to do. Paul gives us the test that we can apply shortly, quickly, that will tell us when spiritual gifts are being used properly. It's in verse 3. Uh, read verse 3, son, real quick, real quick. Read verse 3. <laughs> he wasn't ready. I told you to be ready. Read. And if I give away all my possessions to charity. Verse 3, chapter 12, verse 3. Oh, boy. That didn't work out uh, like that jumper. Put up 12, 3 for me. 12, there it is. Uh, Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You can't even acknowledge he's Lord unless Holy Spirit gives you strength. How do I know I'm using my gift properly when it benefits the kingdom? How do I know I'm using my talent properly when it benefits the kingdom? And you know when you really own it? When you don't care about credit. Okay, okay. The, 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 they, the, the way I can tell whether someone is using their gift under the direction of the Holy Spirit is by whether they use their mouths to proclaim Jesus or their deed. If you do something and want to brag to me about what you did versus the glory God got from it, If, if you want to just go around to your family, yeah, I did this, and that, you know, I was in there, and I was like, woo dee woo dee woo and it was like, woo dee hey, 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 and it was in there. And then that's your thing is always wanting somebody to clap for you versus saying, you know what, God did this, and he used me to do it, and this is the glory God got from it. When you can say, I did this, and this person's life was impacted, this person's life was changed, this person's children came to know who God is because of what God did through me, now you're using your gift properly. Ah, it's not so hard to understand when, when you know that the Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, is committed to this one thing. And that's helping you, through you, proclaim the love of Jesus Christ. The burning desire of the Holy Spirit is to lift up Jesus. Somebody say, lift up Jesus. Lift up Jesus. Quickly, whatever the Holy Spirit inspires us to be or do, 
That's the end result. To lift up Jesus. If we come in here and we're not lifting up Jesus, let's shut it down. If we sing in songs and we're not lifting up Jesus, let's just shut it down. If we have an event and we're not lifting up the name of Jesus, let's shut it down. Because this is supposed to be the Lord's church. And if it's his church, it should be his will. I'm going to tell you something, a pet peeve I have. Um, um, with us, no, no indictment on anybody. I wish, I, uh, this is a pet peeve I have. Pet peeve I have because of the way I read scripture. I'm not saying I'm all the way right. You can differ with me, and that's fine. However, comma, wherever your address is in your place where you live, right, your house, your apartment, wherever that is, or whoever you live, whatever your situation, wherever you call home, right, when you go home, if I was to tell you that, yo, give me your keys, and I'm going to go to your house, and when you get there, let me know, and I'll think about letting you in. <laughs> like, bro, he didn't lost his mind. It was, one, I wouldn't get the keys because it's your house. It would also be crazy for me to tell you, listen, when church is over, I want to welcome you home. You have my permission to go home. Some of y'all be like, bro, who are you talking to? Where y'all get him from? You know, you'd be like real feeling some kind of way because it's your house. It's your house. And for me to turn around and act like it's mine and make you the visitor means you got to bow to my commands. Now, when you come to my house, see, this is the way I grew up. When you go to somebody's house, you sit down. No? Okay. No. You didn't walk around folk house. When you came to my mom and my dad and them house, when you come through the door, my mom, like, okay, you can have a seat right there. You didn't go walking around people's houses and just going around looking in drawers and opening up cabinets talking about, well, y'all didn't got nothing this week? Ain't nobody went grocery shopping? You're like, you can go because you're a visitor. But when you go home, you don't call a friend to ask them, can you open your refrigerator? You don't call a friend to ask them, can you open their cabinet? Because it's your house. What are you saying, Vaughn? Let me give you the relative of what I'm trying to give you today of the consequences of what I'm saying. The thing is this. If you come to my house, it's my house. I rule what happens there. I tell you to sit down. You ask me, can you go to my restroom? And I let you know which restroom you can go to. You get in my car, you listen to what I listen to. You don't touch my radio. Because it's mine. If it's God's church, if it's his house, then why I'm trying to give him permission to move about in his house. Why am I saying, no offense, hear me, we going to usher in the, you don't usher me into my house. This my house. I got the keys to this joint. I got the garage door opener to this because if you usher me in, that means it don't belong to me, it belongs to you. Let's invite him in. No, we don't invite him into his house. He invites. I was glad. Come on, David. When they said unto me, let us go. He's not invited. You are. I am. And if it's his house, you shouldn't be able to control him in his. So you don't control your gift. In his house. You don't tell him when you're going to use your gift. That he, Matter of fact, you don't tell him when you're going to use his gift that he gave you on loan until he come back and say, I don't feel like it today. How dare you? How dare you get to decide 
When you're going to walk the things out of God. I don't feel like it. What if? He said, I don't feel like giving you life today. If God was so sometimey like some of us, what if God said, you know what? I'm going to let you wake up, but you don't need your legs today. Well, we do that to him. I'm going to show up. But I ain't doing nothing. I'll come. Not y'all. I'm talking about your cousins. Be, I'm not, be cool. You straight. How dare you tell your Savior? It's likening to your children telling you in your house what they not going to do. That is the quickest way to lose whatever fronts you had in. Clean your room. I don't feel like it. And whenever, I'm going to tell y'all, if you ain't never seen it, some of y'all that's younger and ain't talked back real lot yet, but you on your verge of doing it because you feel like you're grown, whenever your parent go to looking for people that are invisible, you better run. When you get smart with your mama and daddy and you know ain't nobody in the room and they be like, That's a clear sign. You better hit that door and go anywhere you can. Get up under the bed if you got to because it's about to go down. Because you don't talk back to mama. You don't talk back to daddy. You don't talk back to grandma and you don't tell them what you're going to do in their house. And if you can't talk back to mama and mama you don't like them talking back to you, then why mama talking back to God? Then why daddy talking back to God? Why grandma and grandpa don't want to obey God? Because some of this foolishness we deal with in our home is a byproduct of how we treat God. It's a learned behavior. Next point, I got to close. You know you're a healthy church when the people point to are unified. I got four minutes, Chad. Verse four through six talks about the unity of the church. Our differences have the potential of tearing us apart. Because they cause us to look at the same situation and respond to it totally different ways. But God's intention in giving us different gifts through the Spirit is that we would recognize how much we need each other. And that we would understand how much we can benefit from corporately or cooperating together rather than standing alone. God didn't design you to stand by yourself. He designed you to stand with somebody else to do the work that he's called you to do. You don't have to be an island. You can lock arms with somebody and lock elbow. Wherever you weak, somebody else is going to be strong. And I'm going to tell y'all this. I may be short by myself. I may be small by myself. I may not be as strong by myself. But you give me a couple of us together. And I, matter of fact, come here. That gone, sure. Come here. I may not be scary by myself. But this right here, <laughs> this right here is a force to be reckoned with. And y'all may say, well, they can't fight, but we got something that can. Yeah. <laughs> we got something that'll follow you wherever you want to go. No, just, there you go. go. That's the point. So this is it. I may not be able to do wonders by myself. But when I connect with my brothers and sisters, we do wonders together. The, 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 the thing that the church is supposed to be, because scripture says this, I got to close place that so they know we out of here. Scripture says that signs, this is scripture, I'm not making this up, and wonders shall follow them that believe. What scripture is saying is if I do it by myself, I'm by myself. But D, if I connect with you, then we become the unit that God uses and now others are impacted and they begin to fall in line. That's, oh God, we see signs and wonders and we're always thinking something tangible like a million dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars like somebody who said the other night. Hundreds of billions of people. 
I'm not bringing that in here. I'm just saying. Yeah, you, hundreds of billions and cats and dogs being eaten. Man, shut up. That's you. Lost your mind. It make no sense. And that's the other thing. When you don't understand your rights, they feed you what they want to. I'm not going to get into that today. That's another lesson. We'll probably do it on the Bible study. At the end of the day, don't be fooled by the camera. At the end of the day, when you share your gift with someone else and they connect with you, you allow the world to be able to benefit, and now the signs and the wonders begin to follow you. So everywhere you go, the Spirit of the Lord begins to work and manifest. That's what Scripture means when it says signs and wonders shall follow them. If he meant that signs and wonders shall be on you, then that's what he would have said. But he said they shall follow follow them that believe. That means that I carry such a glory when I'm walking in my gift and my talent that anything that comes into contact with me is impacted by that glory. It's impacted by that anointing. It's impacted by that presence of God. When you operate properly in your gift, not only will people be set free, not only will people be delivered, but let me hit you in your head with this because the Bible says when you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things shall be added. When you walk in your gift, you won't be begging for nothing no more. When you walk in what God has called you to, he'll open up a window of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you have not room enough to receive. Everybody gift ain't preaching. Some of y'all gift is getting out there in them streets and testifying about the goodness of the Lord. Some of your gift is opening up opportunities for others who need jobs and need entrepreneurial opportunities. And God has gifted you and given you talent to understand business, to understand numbers, to understand how government works, to understand how documents work, to understand how contracts work, and you're going to sit on that? The devil is a lie. You want to say, God, whatever you want to do, and when you yield it to God, he will pour you out. <laughs> Lastly, I told Tamika I'd get through these so she could use that screen today. <laughs> Lastly, number three, I, I just led into it on accident. The needs are met. Some of you, watch this, hear me. I want to prophesy on this one, verses 7 through 11. Let me prophesy real quick. 2025 is going to be a super duper year for ministry. Hold on, don't clap, don't clap, because I need you to hear me first. And this is new, because we didn't even say this at 8 o'clock. This is just for 1030. I mean, it's for 8 o'clock, but I'm saying it, it didn't happen at 8 o'clock. You was there, it didn't, I, didn't say, I ain't saying, what I'm about to say, I didn't say 8 o'clock, but you finna grab it, that's why you had to stay. Watch this. God is positioning some of you. Some of you have already been positioned, but he's about to elevate you in different fields of your life. Some of you, he is positioning you. Because what's going to happen in your life, you're going to have more than you know what to do with. Hold on, before you clap, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> you're going to be faced with a choice. You're going to have more than you've had, and your choice is going to be, you're either going to sustain it or you're going to lose it. It's the real of it. Because if you don't operate in your gift and use what he releases the right way, you're going to end up losing it in a matter of time. But when you use it according to what God has designed for you, then you give yourself sustainability. So some are going to see God open up a window and pour out a blessing. And that blessing is going to last through generations through generations. There are others that are going to mishandle the blessing of God, so they're going to be back in the position within two years that they become beggars again. Yeah. Hear me. Hear the Spirit of the Lord. But for those of you that are mentally, emotionally, and spiritually repositioning yourself to say, God, I yield to your spirit. I ain't talking about getting your tithes and offerings. That ain't what this is about. This is about you fulfilling your purpose. Because when you fulfill your purpose, if God has really connected you to the mission, not the man, to the mission that God has given us to lay out in front of you, then the money ain't going to be no issue. Because there are some of you, and thank you, Holy Spirit, there are some of you in this room right now and even on live stream that you're literally going to tithe what you've made the last four months. Holy Spirit, thank you. That wasn't for everybody. I get it. You ain't, gotta, you ain't hurting my feelings. I already clapped for myself. 
you're going to be able to tie what your income was for the last four months. If you, okay, I don't know what that means. That means that whatever you made in the last four months is only 10% of what you're about to get. That's what that means. So, a hundred is ten dollars, ten percent. A thousand is a hundred, right? Ten thousand is a thousand. Twenty thousand is two thousand. Thirty thousand is three thousand, right? So, if thirty thousand is three thousand, and you made thirty thousand in the last four months then 30,000 is the 10% of what? 300, I'm trying to give y'all numbers because I know some of y'all are like, I didn't like math. Let me help you. <laughs> so that means you will be able to do $30,000 worth of tithe because he's released 300,000 into your... <laughs> y'all this? I love it. Well, let's go to my numbers then. I'm going to tithe $1 million because if I tithe a million, then that means my... I was trying to give y'all numbers so y'all could go to Jack in the Box, but let me go on and get these numbers. <laughs> but my point is, your obedience is going to require manifestation to hit your life. Those of you, this is not a ploy for your money. I don't have to do that. It's not a ploy for your money. But those of you that are obedient to God, even when it comes down to your tithe, and you're, I'm the pastor, I got the privilege to speak this over your life, that when you are obedient to your tithe, you're obedient to your offering, and you do not just what we've asked, but when you do it according, because sometimes something can be asked, and God will tell you, no, I want you to do this. God may have you exceed because of what he knows he's about to release for you. Oh, I feel a grace right here. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And some of your, your retirement is going to be better than the days you worked. I don't know who, that just kind of hit me. I don't know what that was for. Oh, my, my, shete. You, you, God, God, God. Some of y'all in your retirement, you finna hit a place where men are going to give into your bosom. There are folk, oh, my, my, shete. There are folk about to come find you. Matter of fact, let, let, let's go buck wild right here. Some of y'all about to travel to places you only imagined you could go. You ain't local no more. God said in the next seasons of your life, I'm allow your feet to hit land that your parents only dreamed about, that you only saw on the internet because your ways are going to please me so you can ask. Stand to your feet. Thank you so much for watching this message and we pray that it encouraged you. Our vision is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference so that they can live a better life. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, please visit our website at copim.org under the Give tab. Also, be sure to like and subscribe and check out all of our other sermons as well. Our services begin every Sunday at 8 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.